Picture this. You're in public. You have a code. And you have this condition where you're vomiting and you're having diarrhea. Every time you sneeze, it's coming out from both ends. Grab your piece of paper. review series my name is dr moses kazevu this is series on my youtube channel where we'll look at medical topics in depth today we're going to be looking at cholera if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel please hit the subscribe button hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time i post grab a piece of paper grab your pen and let's go and if you haven't yet heard of the notice that i posted on the community i may be taking some time off from posting videos and so stay tuned for the next uh, video on leukemias tomorrow at 12 hours. Please do not miss that. It's going to be epic. So when you're talking about cholera, before we actually go into the details of the condition, I want to introduce a new segment which is known as the topic warm-up. This is pretty much a segment where we're going to be asking you questions that enable you to actually know how they could ask you a question with relation to the topic and the discussion. So you have a 46 year old that presents with diarrhea, get a relevant history and ask important questions that will enable you to make a diagnosis. List questions, don't write an essay. So keep this question in mind. We will give you the answer at the end of the lecture. So remember that cholera is this illness that's going to be characterized by excessive diarrhea and vomiting. It's going to be caused by Vibrio cholerae, which is a curved flagellated gram negative bacillus. Remember that this organism can be killed by high temperatures of about 100 degrees for a few seconds. So that is why we advocate for boiling of the water. Then, of course, it can survive in ice for up to six weeks. Now, on the structure of this organism, remember that uh, one major pathogenic serogroup possesses what is known as a somatic antigen, which has two, two subtypes, pretty much the classical as well as the LTOR. Remember that the LTOR is... Uh, an infection that can be actually presenting to you with these mild symptoms, but it can also sometimes present to you with this severe life-threatening disease. When it comes to the pathogenesis of the condition, remember that the transmission of this condition is by the fecal oral route. So pretty much someone gets the condition by con drinking of contaminated water or ingestion of contaminated food stuff. And conditions such as achloridia as well as hypochloridia, where someone reduces the a production of acid in the stomach actually facilitate the passage of the cholera through the intestines. So what is going to happen is that when you ingest this pathogen in the contaminated food or the contaminated water, it's going to inactivate itself so that it can bypass through the acid. And then once it gets into the intestines, it gets reactivated and it will start proliferating in the intestines and it will start producing a certain type of exotoxin that leads to the isotonic diarrhea or the osmotic diarrhea. Now, this toxin that's going to be produced is going to have predominantly two main subunits, an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. Now, the beta subunit is the one that actually binds to the receptor on the enterocyte. So it's pretty much binds to the monocyalogangliocyte um, receptor via the fembrane. Then, of course, you can remember B for binding. So the beta subunit of the cholera toxin binds to this. Then the alpha subunit is what actually enters into the cells and brings about the characteristic effects. Now this alpha subunit goes and stimulates the alpha G stimulatory proteins. And once these alpha G stimulatory proteins have been stimulated, they're going to stimulate the activation of an enzyme that's known as adenylocyclase or adenylate cyclase. Now this adenylocyclase is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of ATP into CAMP. So you get the concentration of CAMP in the cell increasing. So this in turn is going to result in activation of a protein kinase enzyme. And remember that protein kinase enzymes are enzymes that transfer phosphate groups to proteins in the cytosol to proteins on the membrane. So pretty much this is going to lead to an influx of calcium in the cytosol. And in addition to this, it's going to code or it's going to lead to opening of a chloride channel that is found in the apical membrane such that you secrete this chloride into the lumen of the intestines and remember 
once you're secreting chloride into the lumen of the intestines, you make the intestines electronegative. So it means that sodium will not have a tendency to leave the lumen because it will be attracted to the chloride. So it will be retained in the lumen. So what will happen to the osmolarity in the lumen is that there is an increase in the osmolarity in the lumen. And therefore, remember, wherever sodium is going to be, so will water follow. So this is going to lead to draw, drawing of water into the gut, and that's what is responsible for the osmotic diarrhea that uh, we actually see in uh, patients that have cholera or the isotonic fluid secretion that we see in patients that have cholera. Then, of course, the cholera toxin can also release serotonin from the interchromaffin cells. And then, of course, this is going to activate neurosecretory uh, reflexes in the enteric nervous system. And this also accounts for about 50% of the uh, cholera toxins secretory activity. Then there are also other toxins that are produced by Vibrio cholerae, such as zona occludens toxins, as well as accessory cholera toxins that have been attributed or that do contribute to the pathogenesis of the disease. Remember that the clinical features, the incubation period is pretty much a few hours to days. And remember that cholera can present as a mild uh, illness and someone may actually not even know that they have diarrhea um, that is due to cholera. They may attribute this to a di diarrhea that is due to something else. Then there are classically three phases, an evacuation phase, a collapse phase, and a recovery phase. So the evacuation phase, that's where you have this sudden onset of painless Profuse diarrhea, which is watery in nature, it looks like rice water with some flakes of mucus. Then, of course, there may be some vomiting that may be severe in some cases. You may get the next stage if someone doesn't get treatment, they'll go into collapse. So, this is going to be a stage that's going to be characterized by this circulatory shock. So, there will be cold, clammy skin, tachycardia, hypotension, peripheral cyanosis, and signs of dehydration such as sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, and a diminished urine output. There may also be some muscle cramps because of the electrolyte imbalances that may be associated. In children, they may actually have some convulsions that may be due to hypoglycemia and complications such as renal failure and aspiration of the vomitus may actually occur. In the recovery phase, if the patient actually survives the collapse phase, they actually, with adequate treatment, can actually survive. There is a very good prognosis, so they gradually return to normal clinically as well as biochemically in about one to three days. Remember that when it comes to the diagnosis, it's pretty much clinical. So you want to examine the freshly passed stool. And of course, this is going to show you that they are rapidly mortal organisms. Although this isn't really diagnostic of cholera because we have another pathogen that's known as Campylobacter jejuni that may have a similar appearance. We can also order for some rapid dipstick tests that are available. And of course, we may do some stool and rectal swabs that should be taken for culture to confirm the diagnosis and to establish uh, antibiotic sensitivity. And of course, cholera should always be reported to the appropriate public health authority because it's a reportable uh, or notifiable disease. When it comes to the management of the condition, so the mainstay management is pretty much rehydration. So we give the oral rehydration salts or any fluids for each loose stool. So remember that the oral rehydration salts and other fluids should be given until the diarrhea stops. So we first assess for the level of dehydration. Remember that dehydration could either be mild, moderate, or severe, or you could alternatively classify it as no dehydration, some dehydration, and severe dehydration. So with mild dehydration, you're pretty much going to be giving ORS, sorry about that. With mild dehydration, you're pretty much going to be giving ORS about 50 mils per kg in four hours, then about 100 mils per kg per day until the diarrhea stops. If someone has moderate dehydration, you're going to be giving 100 mils per kg in the first four hours, then 10 to 15 mils per kg per hour until they improve. Then you give it 100 mils per kg per day until the diarrhea stops. With severe diarrhea, you want to uh, pretty much give intravenous fluids. You're going to be giving Ringer's lactate. If you do not have Ringer's lactate, then you're going to be giving normal cell line. Of course, at 100 mils per kg in three hours, then you reassess if there's no improvement then you can give uh, the 10 to 15 mils per kg per hour ORS until there is an improvement. And then, of course, you transition them to 100 mils per kg per day ORS until the diarrhea stops. Of course, do not forget to monitor your patient frequently, reassess the patient after four hours, and reclassify their dehydration or dehydration status. Of course, if there are some signs of dehydration, you want to repeat the same management and if the patient actually is showing signs of severe dehydration, then change the management to the sign 
to the management of that of severe dehydration. The patients should be actually encouraged to eat and drink as much as they want. Alternatively, we can also give antibiotics to actually shorten the course of the, the diarrhea and the, the severity of the diarrhea, but they are not always implicated. So we can give doxycycline 300 milligrams as a single dose. Remember that this is um, the drug of choice, but we should actually avoid it in pregnant women. Then of course, we can also give azithromycin one gram as a single dose, tetracycline 500 milligrams four times a day for three days, or erythromycin, um, we can give it uh, four times a day for three days. It's also dose dependent. So this is actually recommended when uh, other antibiotics are not present or other antibiotics are not recommended because um, you may also get um, some areas where you have uh, vibrio cholerae that is resistant to other antibiotics. Then of course there is an immunization that is present and there are some vaccines that have been put on the market, both live attenuated and killed vaccines against cholera. But remember that neither of these vaccines protect you against the O139 strain. And of course, the best preventive measure is good hygiene and improved sanitation. So hand washing, uh, eating cooked food that is cooked thoroughly, and of course, personal hygiene when you're using the toilet, good sanitation programs, and waste management disposal. Here's an algorithm to help everything that I have been talking about on the previous slide. So you can pause the video at this moment. So back to our warm-up question. So we had a 46-year-old patient that presented with diarrhea, so we were asked to take a relevant history. Remember, whenever you're taking a relevant history, assume like you're taking the history in the emergency department. So you want to look at the demographics where this patient stays because it's very important when you're talking about diarrheas. You want to look at the presenting complaint. When did the diarrhea start first? How long has the diarrhea been there for? How often has it happened? Is there any blood? Is there any mucus in the stool? Because this is going to be referred to as dysentery. Is there any abdominal pain or is it painless? Is there any nausea or vomiting? If there is vomiting, how many times? Is there any blood in the vomitus? What is the nature of the vomitus? And then of course, when and where was their last meal? What was their last meal? Are they, did they take milk? Did they take a lot of sugar? Did they take a lot of dairy products? Are they lactose intolerant? Is there any fever that is associated? And of course, the past medical history of them uh, having HIV or any malabsorptive syndromes or any history of abdominal surgeries. Also, you should ask for a drug history because this, um, especially with antibiotics that are taken for a long time, they may have what is known as antibiotic-induced diarrhea, which is often due to Clostridium difficile. And of course, you should also ask for a family history about anyone else that has diarrhea at home. If you enjoyed this type of videos, please drop a like on the video, drop a comment, to show some support, subscribe if you haven't to Zambia and beyond. I'll see you after my break. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu.